The Institute. Institute. Institute for Justice. The National Law Firm for Liberty. Hello, and welcome to Short Circuit, your podcast on the Federal Courts of Appeals. I'm your host, Anthony Sanders, Director of the Center for Judicial Engagement at the Institute for Justice. We're recording this on Wednesday, May 18th, 2022. It's actually the 12th anniversary of my first IJ press conference when I filed my first IJ case. What advice did I receive after that press conference? Don't just read your notes off of a piece of paper. It's not very impressive for the cameras. I think that portion of the press conference did not make its way to TV. That was the start of a case, but today we're going to focus on how cases end. First, what happens if you offer to settle a case But then before you hear back from the other side, the judge rules in your favor. You might think that moots the settlement, but not if you tried to settle it the wrong way. We're going to get deep into some counterintuitive practice procedures in a case from the Ninth Circuit. It's a reminder to all the lawyers listening that it pays to read the rules. Second, when is a case moot? Well, we're learning that with our still somewhat ongoing pandemic, There's an argument that mootness kind of isn't a thing anymore. It's like lawsuits over health restrictions are either always moot or they're never moot because everything is always changing. Well, the Eighth Circuit just ruled that something was moot, although there was a dissenting judge who disagreed, and it might not make much of a difference anyway. Well, here to speak about the end of times and the end of these cases are IJ's Will Ronan and Jeff Redfern, who are also... Uh, trial partners in an upcoming trial. And so they're going to give us their best practice pointers. Welcome, gentlemen. Thanks so much for having me. Hi, Anthony. And Anthony, you're saying we're not supposed to just like read off a piece of paper today? Uh, Well, no one's going to be able to see you. So I think that's okay. I won't tell anybody. But what I would like to hear from you, Will, is about this dispute in Ravalli County, Montana. So first of all, have you ever been to Ravalli County? I have not, but I would like to. It sounds nice. It is. Uh, I, I actually don't think I've been there either. It is just south of Missoula, Montana. Um, there's not a lot of people who live there. And as you might imagine, it's it's absolutely gorgeous area uh, it, way up in the in the Rocky Mountains. It's, but that, Montana that, is one of those states I really do want to visit. Uh, well, when you go there, you should uh, you should of course check out the, this area of the state. It's it's a hard state, of course, to check out all that much. I should also say, Short Circuit will be checking out Montana later this year, um, and we will be doing um, some recording there. But uh, don't have much more details than that at this point. But uh, a little teaser to our Montana listeners. But please tell us uh, there there was. Someone in Ravalli County who it seems like didn't have the best uh, relationship with either an ex or the uh, law enforcement. Yeah. So the underlying issue, just because you brought it up, is pretty interesting. They There was an order of protection and he served a motion on the other side via mail and was arrested for violating the order. Um, pretty clearly, although the case doesn't say it, the case was dismissed and then he sued and brought a 1983 case. Um, but that's sort of a, an interesting side note. The case itself, I think you mentioned, is Kubiak versus Rivali. And reading it, I realized that my brain is absolutely broken um, because this was a fascinating case about the rules of civil procedure. So it's like how you know when you go to law school and you start making those really, really, really bad lawyer jokes, but they're hilarious to you. This case is proof that IJ has just made that worse for me. <laughs> Um, So anyway, this case is about um, Rule 68 or offers of judgment. And basically, a Rule 68 offer is a settlement offer, but it has real consequences for both sides. And it pretty much forces the receiving party, the the plaintiff, to make some absolute and some real choices. So to paraphrase the rule, like it allows parties to serve an offer to allow judgment on specified terms. And usually that's some amount of money, but it actually can be more detailed than that. Once the offer is served, the receiving party has 14 days, and they can either accept it, and if they do, either side files a notice with the clerk, and the clerk absolutely must enter judgment. It's not discretionary. Um, And importantly for this case, by the terms of the rules, the offer stays open for 14 days. It's either accepted. If it's not accepted, it's considered rejected. You have 14 days. Um, The reason Rule 68s are such a big deal is that if the receiving party doesn't accept and ultimately recovers less than the offer, 
then they have to pay the other side's costs from after the offer is made. Um, it's even a bigger deal in cases where attorney's fees are at issue, um, cases like civil rights suits, because if you don't get more than the Rule 68 offer, you actually lose the ability to recover fees. So it really does have legitimate consequences for litigation. With that, back to the case, the, the reason this case is amazing is just because the timing is so perfect and just so unlikely. So it's a civil rights suit um, and defendant, the government files for summary judgment, which sits pending for a few months. It's pretty normal. But while the case or while that the summary judgment motion is pending, the county actually makes the Rule 68 offer of 50 grand plus fees. So the plaintiff then has 14 days to decide one way or the other. But six days later, the court grants summary judgment for the, gov for the government, basically saying, government, you've won. You're probably not going to have to pay. Um, importantly, this was just an ECF entry. There isn't an actual decision, and the order itself says that there will be a judgment to follow. An ECS entry just meaning it was just on the on the docket saying uh, government's going to win, but didn't have more details that, and it also wasn't a final judgment. Exactly right. right. Like I said, my brain is broken. So these, <laughs> okay. um, ECF being the electronic uh, filing system. Yes. So six minutes, literally six minutes after the ECF entry gets emailed to everybody, um, the government emails to withdraw the Rule 68 offer. And then within an hour, the plaintiff says he accepts the offer and instructs the clerk to enter judgment. And just for a second, we should just note that was a really good move by the lawyer. And it took some cojones. That's just good lawyering. And I think we should acknowledge that because it makes a big difference. Um, so that probably forecasts what the court did, or at least what I think about the case. But basically, the questions were, could def A, could defendant withdraw the offer? And B, does the offer survive the summary judgment order? Um, and the Ninth Circuit ruled, as you probably can guess now, that no, a Rule 68 offer cannot be withdrawn. Um, they went through the, the word, the actual wording of the rule. It's really not an overly complicated legal analysis. The rules, the offer stays open for 14 days and it cannot be withdrawn. Um, the rule says what it says. Um, and I like that they also pointed out that because the rule 68 always has real consequences for the receiving party, it should and does have consequences for the one making the offer. And Using it and someone making that offer really needs to think through those consequences and be thoughtful about it. Here, defendant made the decision to make an offer while the summary judgment motion was pending. That was their choice. Um, the, so the case was made a little bit um, easier by the fact that it was an ECF notice and not a final judgment. Um, there is still an open question and a circuit split on whether it would have survived an actual judgment, the, the final decision closing at least the trial portion of this case. But on this fact, it was pretty clean. The rule said what it did. Um, and I, one of the reasons I like it, other than the timing is amazing, I like it because it, it actually gives some real litigation guidance. Um, honestly, I feel like I have a better understanding of how to use and what to do about Rule 68 than I did before. And it also shows the importance of, of good and gutsy lawyering, frankly. Um, the only other thing I want to talk about from it was an interesting issue that I didn't realize that they talked about. And they cited a case called Lang. Um, and it's actually very good to keep in mind. So Lang, there was a Rule 68 offer issued just at some point in the litigation long time before. Um, it was for whatever amount of money. It's for X amount of dollars. The case kept continued on. The parties continued to litigate. And at some point, the parties settled for the same amount of money, just a normal settlement agreement as the Rule 68 offer. After it was accepted, the case was dismissed with prejudice, and the defendant actually sought costs for after the Rule 68. Um, and the court actually ruled that because the number was not more favorable than the Rule 68 offer, um, that ultimately the defendant was entitled to costs, even though it really wasn't part of like what was the common sense part that was contemplated of the settlement agreement. It's just sort of a nice red flag to be aware of that if you ever settle a case on the same terms as a Rule 68 offer, demand at least a couple of dollars more. That's a really good point. I hadn't even thought of that part of it. Um, Jeff, have you ever, did private practice, you ever serve a, a Rule 68 offer or receive one? Um, well, I, I've received them in my IJ practice, but uh, before I was at IJ, I had no experience with them. Um, you know, they, they tend not to come into play in most of our cases here because, you know, we're usually suing for injunctive relief or declaratory relief. Um, and it's not really the kind of case where 
you know, there, there's a compromise about a number. Yeah. I, I had a um, case when I was in private practice, we were defending, we were a defend, defending a corporation and a corporation was suing the corporation, normal corporate stuff. And um, we talked it, we did talk about sending an offer of judgment R- rule 68 is called and you know what that would, how that would work and, and how it plays. And I do remember reading the rule and it was not like people's, and these were, these were guys who have been litigating for a very long time. Um, their understanding of how the rule worked was not what the rule actually said. And so if we had gone down that road, uh, I realized we would have had to been very careful about how it works and dotting our I's and crossing our T's. Um, I'm betting some of the lawyers involved in this case probably didn't understand. Like I, I did not understand that you can't withdraw, um, that you send it out and there's no way to, unlike any other contract offer on earth, right? You can't get that back within 14 days. Um, and the, it seems like the only exception, and and as you said, Will, there's a circuit split, is if the, there actually is a final ruling in the case, then maybe you can get it back. Maybe you, you can't because um, one circuit has said you even then you can't. But um, the the other thing was the attorney's fees. So it says costs. So at the time, I remember when we looked into this, it said costs. Well, okay, well... You know, costs can vary. Costs that aren't attorney's fees can vary in cases. So for non-lawyers listening, you often can get costs for like your filing fee with the court, which is not, it's just a few hundred bucks usually, not very much. But there's all, there can be a lot of costs like experts and um, transcripts for depositions. It, it's not nothing, but in a lot of cases, it's not very much. But that costs in certain parts of the federal rules, costs can mean attorney's fees. Sometimes they do, sometimes they don't. And so if you're in a case where, where by statute you can get attorney's fees, like a civil rights case, that word costs can mean attorney's fees. And like in this case, I, I'm just supposing here, so no no besmirching anyone involved in this case or no me- reading their minds, but like considering the offer that was made I wonder if they realized that cost men attorney's fees, you know, even regardless of um, of the timing uh, issue, because fifty thousand dollars, it sounds like, you know, to getting close to like a nuisance settlement. But I bet there were a lot more of that and that attorney's fees uh, coughed up in this case if they went all the way to summary judgment and had all kinds of depositions, perhaps. So, you know, maybe that was part of the calculus. Maybe it wasn't. So I think this one, the offer actually included attorney's fees. So they it actually said, said attorney's fees? I think okay. it said it. And that, that's that pretty bit. cool. But that's also a cool thing about the way the offer is written is, and it comes up in the case in sort of an interesting way. You can craft a pretty tailored and unique Rule 68 offer. You still have to be careful to stick within the confines of the rule. It needs to be something that can be entered as a judgment. It can't be like something some party needs to do. Um, but it, it gives a lot of flexibility. Gotcha. It's a pretty powerful rule if you know how to use it, but it seems like there's always new pitfalls. Like I did not know about the Lang rule. I just did not yeah. know that. And it also seems like something it pays you to do earlier in the case, especially with attorney's fees and not like when you have, when you, I mean, the other side hadn't moved for summary judgment. It was the government moved for summary judgment. And then they're trying to like nuke their own motion of this offer, <laughs> which uh, unfortunately for them was was maybe some bad timing. Um, so Jeff, you have a case where there's also some bad timing or just kind of weird timing or timing all over the place, uh, with this, uh, school in Iowa. So, uh, what's, what's going on there and is this case moot? <laughs> well, this is yet another COVID case. And as in all COVID cases, um, timing is everything. Um, so this, this is out of the eighth circuit. It's called Ark of Iowa v. Reynolds. Um, And this is a case that was brought uh, by the parents of kids who were at heightened risk um, from COVID. Either, you know, they had some pre-existing conditions or, um, you know, they they were particularly susceptible to infection or something like that. Asthma or that that kind of thing. Yeah, Yeah. Yeah. So they were challenging an Iowa statute that made it illegal for school districts to uh, impose, uh, implement, enforce their own mask mandates. But uh, 
Somewhat importantly for this case, there's also provision in the law um, that said that schools can enforce mass requirements if the requirements are, quote, otherwise imposed by law. Um, so I think what that means is just that, you know, the district can't have a policy, but if some other, you know, local government, federal government, whatever says you need to have masks, um, then that law would still apply. It just takes it out of the hands of the district. So uh, these plaintiffs sued under the Americans with Disabilities Act, and the ADA requires schools to make reasonable accommodations uh, for students with disabilities. Um, so the, I guess the argument here is that the children had a unique vulnerability to COVID, and that was a disability, and a mask mandate for their schools, at least, would have been a reasonable accommodation that would have protected them um, because of their disability. Now, in the district court, the district court actually enjoined the enforcement of this Iowa law. Um, and, you know, they said, you're, you're likely to win. He entered a preliminary injunction um, and said, you know, you have a strong ADA claim. Um, so Iowa appeals this up to the Eighth Circuit. Now, the district court opinion or, or order was entered in um, September of 2021. Um, so just recently, um, the Eighth Circuit dismisses the appeal. Um, and what happened here is, is really weird. It's hard to wrap your head around. A two-judge majority, um, in a per curiam opinion, held that the preliminary injunction was moot because intervening events such as vaccine approval for children and the new prevalence of less dangerous variants of COVID um, had basically made COVID less dangerous. So uh, it was no longer important for these kids, supposedly, um, to get the relief that the preliminary injunction gave them. Now, it's really unclear what the majority is talking about when they say that the preliminary injunction is moot. Um, normally, when we talk about mootness, we're talking about Article Three case or controversy mootness, um, where there literally is no longer a case because the court is incapable of granting the requested relief. Um, so the classic example of that would be like if these children at issue in the case had graduated from school. So, you know, the mask mandate no longer has any impact on them one way or another. They're, they're off to college. Um, the case would be moot. But that's not what happened here. The court just said that uh, the relief that you requested that you were getting at one point uh, is no longer that important to you. Um, and that's, that's not normally the way uh, mootness works. So here's the quote. No court could grant effective relief as sought for the preliminary injunction because enjoining defendants enforcement of section 280.31, the Iowa statute, has no effect on plaintiff's children whose risk of contracting COVID-10 at schools is now low even without um, mask requirements. And I just noticed that, that COVID-10 is, is clearly a typo in the opinion. <laughs> um, and to me, that sounds like a quintessentially merits determination about how you would do um, the ADA analysis, not a, a determination that the case itself is moot. Um, and then it's not clear, though, what happens next. So the court says, to the extent that this case continues, the court below should pay attention to the provision that says that this Iowa statute does not apply where any other provision of law requires masks. And the majority implies that the ADA would be such a requirement so that this, this whole fight is really a tempest in a teacup, um, as my former judge would say. Now, there's a, a fairly lengthy dissent from Judge Kelly, and she flagged the weirdness of this mootness analysis right off the bat. Um, she says in a footnote here, I, I assume that the majority you know, was not using the term moot to refer to Article Three mootness. She says, I'm going to assume that what they meant is that the circumstances have changed so much that the merits of the preliminary injunction need to be reconsidered in the first instance, that, you know, the litigation has to continue, new evidence has to be weighed. Um, it would be pointless for us to weigh this because the facts that we would be weighing are out of date. Um, and that, that seems reasonable to me. But what's weird is that the majority didn't clarify its position in response to this footnote. Um, 
you know, judicial opinions, when you have a, a majority and a dissent, it's not like they're poker hands where they drop them at the same time and then, <laughs> you know, you see where the chips fall. These get circulated between chambers. So you would expect that if the dissenting judge says, it's totally unclear whether you're talking about Article 3 mootness or something else, that the majority would say, no, yeah, we are talking about Article 3 mootness, or no, we're definitely not. And then having clarified their position, the dissent would not need to have that footnote. Um, so the reason that that didn't get clarified is, uh, well, that's anyone's guess. Um, but it is it is awfully confusing um, because, as I, I noted above, it's hard to see this as a true Article 3 mootness problem. Like Clearly, they could have mask ma mandates or they could not have mask mandates. Whether they are important or justified seems to be more of a merits decision. So I'm, I'm with the dissent on that one. Um, and another, another solid point she makes is that, you know, if, if we're looking at the cases about dissolving or modifying injunctions um, due to change circumstances, which, which happens all the time, normally the burden is on the party that wants the injunction changed to show evidence, um, to, to demonstrate that this injunction is no longer appropriate because of the changed circumstances. And that didn't happen in this case. What happened is just that the majority said, oh, we, we are going to essentially take judicial notice uh, based on what we're reading in the news that everything is different now um, without actually looking at you know, litigated facts. So that, at least that far, I'm, I'm definitely on the dissent side. Um, but then, then Judge Kelly walks through the ADA analysis and ultimately concludes that the plaintiffs were entitled to their preliminary injunction. Um, now, I, I am not an ADA lawyer, so my opinion in, in this regard is, is worth almost nothing. But my knee-jerk reaction is that um, requiring everyone in an institution um, to wear a mask because someone else has uh, a susceptibility to infection um, is a, a pretty aggressive um, accommodation under the the, at least the ADA cases that I've seen. Um, and the ADA only requires reasonable accommodations. Um, of course, you know, reasonableness is in the eye of the beholder and I'm not an ADA lawyer, as I said before, but it, it does seem like a bit of a stretch to me. Um, and then the, the last point that the judge Kelly makes is that she, she does agree that the injunction was too broad because, um, it applied statewide. And she said, look, the ADA is, is about reasonable accommodations for particular people with particular disabilities. So if there's going to be an injunction, it has to apply to these particular students in their particular schools, not to every single school. So um, she, she at least shows a little bit of, of sympathy for, uh, I think, the, the majority's lack of patience with, with the breadth of the, uh, the remedy below. Um, but... Yeah, for, for me, the, the weird thing about this case is just the, the lack of clarity about what is going on with mootness here. And I, I think it is really disappointing when a judge flags a, a potentially crucial issue in a case. Like if, if you're going to read this case and know what it means, like you have to know, are they talking about Article 3 mootness or are they just saying that this is changed circumstances for a preliminary injunction? Um, and, and that is just there is just no way from reading the majority's opinion to know which they're talking about. So uh, to, to me, that's that's the most frustrating thing about this. I think that the majority is, is right that at at least at some point, you know, these these cases are going to be done and uh, it's it's probably going to be sooner rather than later. Uh, but, you know, precedents about what uh, Article Three mootness means will be on the books for a long time, and uh, and it's important that we, as litigants, understand it. Will, do you understand this case? I can't wait for pandemic law to be over. That's what <laughs> I understand. <laughs> that is genuinely what I understand. Uh, I also think we probably need more clarity on the preliminary injunction standards. It does feel like a lot of courts are talking around each other. I know there's been a lot of criticism about the use of the quote unquote shadow docket for it. Um, so I do think some greater clarity as to like what it means for likelihood success on the merits. And a, just like I said, better clarity would be warranted, but not in pandemic cases. And please, these need to stop now. Yeah, having litigated 
uh, preliminary injunctions in the Eighth Circuit a couple of times. Um, I know that they have a they have a rule that isn't even announced in this case. Well, it's at least in constitutional cases that you have to have a likelihood of success on the merits, and then they go through the other factors. Because sometimes in in preliminary injunctions, you get the sense, well, if there's really, right, because the two most important things for the preliminary injunction uh, is that you have a likelihood that you'll win at the end of the day on the case, and that you're going to be harmed now in a way that can't be made up later, right? We're getting money damages later. And often you might have just really, really, really strong irreparable harm, but who knows about the merits? Um, and in a private lawsuit, sometimes that makes sense. But in in the Eighth Circuit, they have this, essentially everything boils down to the, the likelihood. And the Supreme Court has been a little more cagey about that. And that would be that would be some nice, um, uh, nice for it to, to, to say one way or the other. And I'm not really voicing which way it, it should be. I think there's there's arguments on on either sides of that. Um, but yeah, the, what I get from this case, Jeff, is that the this is this appeal is just about this preliminary injunction. So there, this case like is still around. So they could come to a final judgment on the case and provide more evidence. And God knows, maybe there's going to be another, you know, a surge of some kind or some new variant. And then they could say, okay, now we get our injunction, um, a permanent injunction. And perhaps they should get that, but um, the, the the majority's opinion here kind of shows that like that maybe that can never be true because things keep changing, and or maybe you could get an injunction for like a month, but then you need to come back, and it it, it almost makes the whole nature of like a lawsuit in this area. Uh, Pointless. I mean, whether you're ask, whether you're challenging a mask mandate or whether you're trying to impose a mask mandate, like like is going on here. Yeah, and I think that's what. Well, if if Judge Kelly in, in dissent is right, then I think even they could still get a preliminary injunction. They would just have to litigate it again on the current facts, right? Um, which, which will be moot by the time it comes to uh... <laughs> exactly. So there won't be a appellate review. Um, I, and I think that at least sort of justifies the rule that normally the the burden is on the party that wants to change the injunction to demonstrate the changed facts, uh, because it, it sure puts a high burden on plaintiffs to say you have to prove that you're entitled to an injunction now and then continue proving it every single day uh, affirmatively or else we're just going to, you know, essentially assume that things have changed I, I know I know I'm mixing my mythologies here, but I'm pretty sure the Dante's third circle of hell was Sisyphus litigating mask mandate injunctions every <laughs> single day for all of eternity. Uh, yeah, it kind of <laughs> seems like that. That that's my role here. I, I add a lot to the legal analysis. You're welcome. <laughs> I mean, of course, in this case, I think at the end of the day, it it really doesn't matter because of the majority's last paragraph. Um, you know, the, the majority said this law doesn't trump the ADA. So you can, if you demonstrate, you know, that you, that you're entitled to an ADA, you don't need an injunction against this law's enforcement. We are in normal ADA land. Well, but you do need a rule. I mean, through a declaratory judgment, maybe, which is different than an injunction, uh, that there's a violation of the ADA to not have a mass mandate. Which again is a pretty aggressive argument, but that that's their argument. But my my understanding is that the the defendant's position um, was essentially that that the ADA did not uh, trump because it yeah. was not because the ADA did not the ADA certainly doesn't impose a mask mandate in explicit terms. It doesn't say that schools have to have them. It just says you have to have reasonable accommodations and. According to Iowa, reasonable accommodations, that was not the kind of law that trumps this. Now, the majority said, oh, sure it does. If, if you go through the ADA analysis and it says you have to have masks, then, then that does trump this law. Right. I mean, that's what, that, whatever Iowa law says because it's a federal law and the, the supremacy clause. 
You know, I also thought when you looked at the the facts that the dissent was laying out, they were she uh, the dissent was talking about one of the students had asthma and the nurse refused to wear a mask directly in front while giving that student her asthma medication. I feel like that is a much more reasonable accommodation or much more narrowly tailored than saying every person in this building, every for every moment that they are in this building must wear a mask. And I think the ADA would have greater tailoring than that than just everyone must do it all the time. I think that's right. And I think that's that's why Judge Kelly was was flagging that, you know, even though she disagreed with the majority, she thought the injunction was too broad. Um, and that, you know, if, if you look at ADA cases, it does typically involve or they do typically involve a lot of, of careful tailoring like that. Um, and I, I could easily see the result being something like, you know, the the people who are directly interacting with these students who are in their classroom with them have to do it, but not necessarily everyone in every other classroom or, or something like that. Um, and that's the kind of give and take that you get in ADA litigation typically. Well, I'm glad we figured this out for uh, for the parties and per- perhaps um, <laughs> remand. They they could do something that s- sounded pretty sensible, what you guys just had to say. This will probably not be the last pandemic law um, case that we have, but uh, I am hoping we're getting there. Um, maybe the, uh, the, the federal courts won't be quite as full up with these questions uh, a, a year from now. Um, most of them have, have gone to meet their maker, but we'll, we'll still see how many more ha- uh, we have to come. But there's lots of interesting quirks of the federal courts and the uh, Constitution that we've learned along the way. I'd like to thank our guests for coming today. Good luck on your upcoming trial, guys. Maybe Thanks we'll hear so about much. that at a later short circuit. But for now... I want everyone to have uh, a beautiful uh, May afternoon or wherever, you, whenever and wherever you are listening to, uh, to this podcast and for everyone to get engaged. Mm-hmm.